today we'll talk about how the revolution in genetic science has impacted medicine and your experience with medicine and how that's going to be more and more prevalent in the future. Advances in genetic science are going to have a major impact and already having a major impact on how we receive medical care in the future. For instance, your genetics underlines how you're different from other people. You ever wonder why a drug works for one person but doesn't work for another even though they have the same exact disease and the same exact symptoms? That has to do with the genetics that affect your biology and how your biology responds to those drugs. The science of how your genetics impacts your response to drugs is called pharmacogenetics. It's a fairly new science, but we've come a long way in understanding the differences between why one person might respond to another drug and another person actually gets worse under the same drug. Over time, we've learned more and more associations between how variants in your DNA affect your biology that's important for how you respond to a particular drug. For instance, drugs are metabolized and converted either into active metabolites or into inactive metabolites and cleared from your body. How that occurs is through enzymes that are proteins that are coded for by genes. And variation in those genes affect how those enzymes carry out those metabolic processes. For instance, if you don't have the gene for a particular enzyme, you may not be able to metabolize and clear a particular drug. And over time, that drug would accumulate in your body and become toxic le at toxic levels eventually. The other major way that genetics plays into how you respond to individual drugs is that a lot of times drugs act at specific proteins in the body called receptors. And those receptors are coded for by genes. And variations in those genes can affect how those receptors respond. For instance, there's a gene for the opiate uh, mu receptor, and it's called OPRM1. And there's a very common variation in that gene that makes it where about 20% of the population don't respond well to opiate analgesics and don't get pain relief. In addition, that same mutation makes them much more likely to be, have a fatal overdose from an opiate. So not only does it affect how you respond to a drug, but it also affects the drug's safety. So in addition to metabolism, we have what we call response genes. And so those two things together give a, a pretty integrated picture of how people would respond based on their genetics to a particular drug. Now the utility of this information is in the clinic. For instance, how do I know what drug's going to be best for you. You have, let's just say, high blood pressure. How do I know which drug is going to be best for you and that you're not going to have some genetic-based problem either in metabolizing or responding to that drug? Well, we can now test for those very specific mutations in these very important genes that we know have an impact on how you respond to those drugs. And by using that information, we can then choose the drug that is absolutely best for you. Now, when I say best for you, you have to understand when we develop drugs, we do it based on a population model. In other words, we look at a large group of people, and then when we decide that this drug works or not, it's based on how it worked for the majority or the average person. But when you do that, you essentially leave off 50% of people who don't have an average response to that drug. So that's the whole idea behind personalized medicine, which is moving from a population-based approach to evaluate and, and you know, determine whether or not drugs work for someone to an individual approach based on their specific genetic blueprint. Another example of a very common drug that has a very important genetic determinant in how you respond to it is the anticoagulant named Plavix. Plavix is used to prevent your blood from clotting and to prevent strokes and heart attacks in people who have either had a previous stroke or have some sort of clotting disorder that would make them susceptible to a stroke. Plavix is a unique drug in that it's called a prodrug. In other words, it itself in the pill form that you take has no activity. It has to be converted by your liver by this enzyme called CYP2C19 that's in your liver that converts it to its active form. And then that can then prevent your blood from clotting. 
that only about a third of the population actually have normal metabolic activity through that particular enzyme. So if they're deficient in the activity, then they don't get the clinical benefit of plavix because it's not converted to its active form. And therefore, people don't get the protection that they are intending to get from heart attacks and stroke. On the other hand, a large number of people actually have excessive activity through the 2C19 enzyme. And that converts plavix too fast. And so their blood actually gets too thin. It does, you know, it's, it's beyond just preventing it from clotting. And it makes them at risk for bleeds. And these bleeds can be fatal. So if you have that variant that causes you to have excessive enzyme activity and over uh, convert plavix to its active form, you're eight and a half times more likely to have a serious bleed or stroke based on an adverse drug event from plavix. So understanding that, if you knew that someone had that, you could give them a different anticoagulant that's not reliant on the 2C19 pathway for activation. And therefore, you could prevent someone from having a serious adverse event. In addition to the clinical side of pharmacogenetics, we can also use genetic information to determine whether we have vitamin deficiencies that are genetically based. And then we can use that information to tailor supplemental regimens for us so that we can take the vitamins that we actually need and help us prevent disease and optimize our health. So these sorts of wellness uses for genetics are becoming more and more popular. Uh, for instance, we can even tell you uh, through a gene that, that codes for how thick your muscles are, whether or not someone at birth is going to be more suited for distance running per se, some sort of endurance activity, than football, for instance, where power and muscle strength are critically important. So understanding these things, you can work with your genetics to optimize um, your performance. About two and a half years ago, it became possible to actually use genetics to identify infectious pathogens, viruses, bacteria, fungi, uh, very accurately. And we've had a problem with being able to do that in the past. There's currently a crisis, a global crisis, in antibiotic resistance where the pathogens, the little uh, microscopic organisms, develop ways to become immune to our antibiotics. And it's gotten to a point where we don't have that many antibiotics left that work very well. Again, about two and a half years ago, it became possible to do this in an economically feasible manner. So now what we can do, instead of having to, used to, in order to identify what infectious agent someone had that was causing their infection, we would have to culture that. We'd have to grow it on a, a Petri dish and then identify it with a microscope. And unfortunately, about 30% of the time, you can't get the organism to grow on the Petri dish. And then about 30% of the time, once you do it, you misidentify it through a visual inspection. What we can do with genetics is we can actually use the, the organism's own genetics to accurately identify the species of microorganisms causing the infection. We can also look for genes that those organisms carry that confer antibiotic resistance. And we can then use that information in order to prescribe the most appropriate antibiotic for the actual organism that is causing your infection. So if you can do that, what you can do is you can eliminate the inappropriate and unnecessary use of antibiotics, preserve those for future generations, but more importantly, give the person now that's infected by identifying the pathogen and identifying the most appropriate drug to give for that pathogen, we can actually cure that patient more efficiently and prevent them from progressing to a more serious form of infection. The current COVID-19 pandemic has actually made people a little bit more aware of the use of genetic testing. We use PCR, polymerase chain reaction, in order to identify the, the virus, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19. So when you hear about all these testing going on, all this testing is PCR-based genetic testing, where we use the RNA of the, of the COVID virus to identify it very accurately. So 
this sort of thing now is in the public knowledge, the public domain. People know about it. And it's an important part of getting a handle on this COVID-19 pandemic. One of the advantages of using PCR for COVID detection was that we can actually detect other pathogens that might be uh, present at the same time called co-infections. Most respiratory viral pandemics in the past, more people have died from secondary bacterial infections than from the initial viral infection. And that's been true for numerous pandemics, including even recently. So I just published a paper with colleagues in August where we looked not just at COVID, but whether there were other respiratory pathogens present. What we found was that 86% of the subjects that were COVID positive, and this is a 12,075 patient study where 1,690 of them were COVID positive. Of that 1,690 COVID positive patients, 86% of them had other respiratory infections, co-infections at the same time. Now, while we can't treat COVID very well at the moment, even though I'm, I'm very hopeful that we will have therapeutics in the very near future, we can treat these other infections. And so treating them can improve outcomes, reduce the mortality, and reduce the morbidity of, of the COVID infections. And that, of course, now that we can test for multiple infections with PCR at the same time, that has other implications for how we tackle uh, treating infectious disease. All of these things that two decades ago seemed almost impossible to think about being a part of regular clinical practice, well, they've now become possible and they're available. So I look with great anticipation for how the future is going to roll out for personalized medicine and the revolution that genetics is, uh, is uh, causing in the field of medicine right now. But I can tell you that it'll probably be more impactful than even one can imagine. Thank you so much.